So welcome to another edition of the NCBI podcast. I'm June Tinsley, Head of Communications with NCBI. Um, and during this series of podcasts, uh, I've had the pl- pleasure of interviewing many individuals who are living with sight loss um, and embarking on varied different careers and, and activities. But today I am, I'm joined by Mandy Davidson. Um, and it's really important to kind of get a, a lens on uh, eye health from a clinical perspective. So Mandy is a, an optometrist by trade. She is in, works with the independent practice in the south of England, but she's also uh, the professional affairs manager with Scope Eye Care. Thanks, Mandy, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me, June. Great, great. Um, well, I, I suppose we, we, my request to have you on with us today is just to try to um, create a little clarity out there uh, for people who are new to the whole world of sight loss and want to just get a little bit of clarity around different areas um, and also just to give it some tips around eye health and eye care. So um, if it's OK with you, I suppose I'm going to ask a, a, quite a, a basic question, but one that I think can cause confusion for some people when you're talking about different roles within the eye care health area. So I suppose, would you mind explaining what the, the role of an optometrist is? Of course, it would be a pleasure. Um, There are lots of of words and lots of terminology and certainly lots of people that you will come across when you are um, having your eyes examined. But the role of the optometrist is really to examine your eyes and check the health of you and check their health to see whether you need a prescription for glasses. Um, We tend to work on the high street, but in the UK, optometrists can certainly work in a hospital setting too. They are qualified to say examine your eyes for um, health conditions to see whether you need a prescription for glasses and they can also fit contact lenses for you as well. Now you may come across some other names within a practice when you go and have your eyes tested and a dispensing optician is an optician that is qualified to dispense all types of spectacles. Then there's a contact lens optician starting to get complicated now, but a contact lens optician is a dispensing optician who's taken a further qualification in contact lenses and now they have specialised it in in fitting them. So they can also fit and supply contact lenses, but they do have to have um, sort of the sign off from an optometrist first to say that that patient is suitable. And I suppose the only other person to to mention is an ophthalmologist and lots of people get optometrist, ophthalmologist confused. So an optometrist is somebody that tests your eyes for glasses and checks the health of your eye. But an ophthalmologist is a medically qualified doctor who will specialise in eyes. Now, these ophthalmologists can um, diagnose and treat eye conditions as well as performing operations and surgery. Some will test eyes for glasses, but they don't usually make the prescription up. They'd send you off to your local optician in the high street to get them made up. I think that's probably all the people you'd come across. Does that help, you? It does, and I suppose it, it helps clarify um, each individual's role in the whole area of eye care. Um, it doesn't help that all the professions names all start with an O. So that's what <laughs> tricks me up all the time. Um, but am I correct in thinking that as an optometrist, as you say, you, you, your role is to check the eye health. Um, so if something um, sparks a worry in you, that you would refer that individual to an ophthalmologist. Absolutely. Now, we can manage certain conditions in in practice, but yes, if it's anything um, that's more sinister or more serious, then we would start a referral pathway off to an ophthalmologist who would then be able to medically treat that condition. Okay, okay, that's helpful to know. Um, And uh, as you mentioned, uh, one of the key aspects of the optometrist is to um, test and see whether you need glasses. Yes. Um, and, and also, uh, the, I suppose I'm curious in terms of the debate between an individual wearing glasses over contact lenses. And from your perspective, what are the pros and cons of, of that debate? Ah, there's, there's, um, there's lots of pros and cons of both, actually. And, you know, no, no one answer is right for everybody. And I would suggest that anybody who, you know, likes the idea of wearing contact lenses should certainly have a discussion with their their optometrist even if if it hasn't come up you know ask the optometrist and just say 
is my prescription suitable for wearing contact lenses? You know, do you think I'm a suitable candidate? Um, let's just talk about the advantages of contact lenses because they, they do offer a great alternative to specs and they have um, great optical and functional rules. Now, those of us, if we've got um, a high or, or moderately high prescription, know that if you look slightly off centre, the vision might be a little bit distorted through our specs or, you know, there's that gap between the specs and the side of your face that you can't really see clearly out of, you have to turn your head more. Well, contact lenses will actually give you improved peripheral or that all round vision, because what happens is the contact lens sits on the surface of your eye, it moves with your eye, so you're always looking through the optical centre of the lens. So that's great because it reduces any distortions and reflections that you may have got from, from your glasses. Yeah. The other the other big plus, um, and you'll laugh at this, but all spectacle wearers will know, is that, you know, they don't collect moisture from the rain or the snow when you're out on a wet day. Yeah. Um, and possibly more topically, um, they don't steam up when you're wearing your mask. Yes, I mean, that's very yeah. bad in this day and age. Absolutely. And, you know, that drives me around the bend at the moment when I'm going out. I always have to sort of readjust my glasses. Um. Other positives is that they're great for sport, where there's a risk that your glasses might break or slip or simply just be in the way. And of course, you can use um, contact lenses with goggles or even off the shelf sunglasses, and you don't have to worry about getting them made up with a special prescription. Some people just don't like wearing glasses, June, and it really sort of knocks their confidence and they feel that if they've got lenses in and they haven't got this frame on their face that they they can be a they can be more themselves and i've actually seen this in children their confidence really grows if they've been wearing glasses they may have unfortunately been sort of ribbed a little bit at school the minute you put them in contact lenses they come back and see you for their follow-up appointments and they're a different child, you know, their, their face is lit up, they're much more confident, there's a real spring in their step. So, you know, there's kind of psychological advantages to wearing them a little bit as well. And I suppose the other thing is that there are some eye conditions that contact lenses are the only option for because you just can't get a stable vision in a pair of specs. An example of this is something called kerat keratoconus, and this is where the front surface of the eye is irregular and it requires a rigid contact lens to sit on it in order to form clarity of vision. And that's something that can't be achieved with glasses. So there's plenty uh, of advantages there, obviously. Absolutely. Now, I am going to counteract that with a few disadvantages, although I don't think any of them are big enough to be a, a you know, a potential don't even consider them. Um, because contact lenses do take a lot of looking after. You've got to be responsible. You know, cleanliness is so important because there is a risk of, of infections. If you've got bugs on your hands and you put them into your, you know, it, then they get transferred to the lens. The lens gets transferred to your eye. You're, you're potentially sitting there with a bug on the lens in your eye all day. So hand washing is so important. We know that now anyway, but very, very important with contact lenses. Um, we encourage patients to wash their hands before and after handling their lenses at all times. Um, you have to make sure that the lenses stay clean and that if you're wearing reusable lenses that you have to disinfect them every night just to make sure that they're, they're, they're super, super clean. Um, and of course, if you are putting something in and out of your eye every day, you know, you might slightly scratch it or, or you know, um, abrade it. So you are at a slightly more in risk increased risk of, of corneal infections. Wearing lenses can be more costly than glasses because um, especially if you're going to wear the, the daily disposables that you, you're wearing every day and you are going to need more regular checkups when you visit your optometrist because obviously there is a, um, a foreign object going into your eye, albeit a safe one, and we need to make sure that the, the ocular surface of your eye stays really healthy. And I suppose the, the the conversation I have with my patients a lot of the time as well is that you do still need a backup pair of glasses because there may be times when you've either unwell, you've got a cold, you might even have an eye infection when you just can't wear your contact lenses. So you you, you can't really say goodbye to glasses forever. Um, yeah, you do need to keep that yeah, backup. Yeah, that's a, a practical suggestion as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, 
Can I just ask you, um, you mentioned there's something about interesting about children and contact lenses. Is there a certain age at where you would say that it's OK for children to start wearing contact lenses because their eye health isn't going to be compromised as, they're, as they as they grow? Yeah, I mean, they're getting into the whole um, contact lens in children conversation, um, we could talk and talk and talk on that. But if you think about um, an age that they can they can wear them, I judge the maturity of the child. And I think a lot of optometrists do that if they're responsible enough to understand the hygiene rules and responsible enough to know that, you know, if it doesn't feel right, you've got to take it out. Um, you know, I've I've had eight year olds, seven, eight year olds in contact lenses, pretty mature ones or, or mum might wear contact lenses so that, you know, they know what they're doing at home. But providing they can put them in and take them out. Um, absolutely. But judge the, you know, the, the parents got to be happy. The child's got to want to do it. Um, it doesn't work if mum and dad bring them in and say, I want them to have contact lenses. If the, the child doesn't really like the idea, you're, you know, it's a non-starter. It's not fair on the child. True. So I suppose, it, as you rightly say, it, it's a case by case basis um, and to be guided by, by the patient is really the primary issue there. Absolutely. And I, I suppose the other thing to do if we're talking about children, um, and I'll only touch on it briefly, is that... Um, there is a, a lot of research being done about contact lenses and myopia control in children. So if children are short sighted, um, there is growing evidence to suggest that if you put them in a certain type of contact lens, you may be able to slow down the progression of the myopia or the short sightedness. So that's definitely a conversation to have with your optometrist if you're, you're concerned about your, your child's um, eyesight. OK, interesting. I suppose the other question that I have around the contact lenses is, um, do you have an opinion about which is better, whether it's the daily disposables or the ones that you can reuse? I think um, most optometrists will say to you that daily disposables would be our preferred choice. Um, as contact lenses have evolved over the over the years, and I'm going to show my age now and say that I actually went to the the, the first PR meeting when they told they you know showed us contact lenses and then said right now throw it in the bin you're going to throw that away it was like wow are we really going to start reusing uh, throwing away contact lenses, but since. Uh, frequently replaced lenses, so two weekly lenses or even daily disposables have, have come about, the number of eye infections or problems with patients wearing lenses has reduced. That's interesting. So um, my, my preference, my first choice is always now a daily disposable, but you have to weigh up the cost implications of that and it doesn't work for everybody. Um, so, you know, a, a frequently replaced lenses fortunately now most of them are either monthly replacements two weekly replacements or dailies we haven't got that long long stint in in them now and this is soft lenses rigid lenses are a little bit different but it's the soft lenses the daily disposables are really i in my opinion much much healthier uh, for your eye because um you're you're putting a clean sterile lens in every day you're not having to rely on one that's been soaking overnight in a disinfecting solution, but you're just taking away another risk factor. Yes, exactly, exactly. And I suppose that risk factor isn't even there when you're talking about glasses. Um, no. You're putting anything um, in your eye. So in your opinion, what would you say would be the advantages of sticking with the regular glasses? They're just, well, I mean, regular glasses are just easy to put on, aren't they? You know, you take them out of the case, you give them a clean and you pop them on. Um, you haven't got all that regular disinfecting like you have with contact lenses. Although I would hasten to add in our current COVID times that it, it won't go amiss to make sure you give your glasses a clean a little bit more frequently, especially when you've been out and about in the supermarket or somewhere in an enclosed space, you know, giving them a, a good wash down would, would be a good good thing to do. But you can change your looks with glasses, can't you? You can have fun pairs, you can have serious pairs, you can change your image, you can wear them like a, a fashion accessory and be quite stylish with them. Um, of course, there's fewer infection risks because you're not actually putting lenses in and out of your eye. And actually, if you're wearing glasses, they are a barrier. There's less 
um, tendency to touch or to rub your eyes if your glasses are on. Um, and for exactly the same reason, they offer you a bit of protection when you're out and about in the wind from debris and dust flying around. And uh, contact lens wearers will tell you, especially the, the little rigid ones that people don't tend to wear quite so much now. You know, if you're out on a windy, dusty day, you're very aware of keeping your eyes shut if a gust of wind comes around the corner. <laughs> true, true. Um, disadvantages of glasses though, because I've got to make this fair, you know, I've, I've up, up and down contact lenses. Glasses, uh, there are a few disadvantages because they can be heavy and cumbersome and uncomfortable. They can make your ears sore and your nose sore. So, you know, you may, must go back to your, your optician and make sure they're adjusted properly. Um, I suppose that's a little bit unfair because there are thinner lenses available now and nice lightweight frames. So even people with very high prescriptions now, we can be very clever with lenses and make thinner lenses that sit in the frames. Um, and for the reason I discussed with the contact lenses, you know, some people just don't like wearing their glasses because it feels they hide their facial beauty. Um, glasses can be in the way of some activities. They can give you those distortions or reflections if you if you catch the light at the wrong angle. And again, the confidence issue, some people just don't like their glasses. True. And I, I suppose at the end of the day, it, it really is a very subjective decision whether a patient opts for, for glasses or contact lenses. Absolutely. Um, and, it, you know, there's no one answer. It's what's right for you, what works for you. I have lots of patients that kind of do 50-50. They have daily disposable lenses that they wear socially if they're going out um, or maybe for sport. And then they wear the glasses the rest of the time and they kind of get the best of both worlds then. But it, it's have the conversation with your optometrist. Um, if you're interested in contact lenses about whether you're suitable, whether your ocular surface, the front part of your eye is actually suitable to have lenses, but go for it. And, and embrace it, basically. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Don't be afraid of them. Um, lots of people say, oh, I'll never I'll never be able to put them in and out. I'll never I'll never manage to handle them. Um, I have taught people my oldest patient that I fitted with contact lenses was 75 so age is no barrier okay True. um and I've done gentlemen with very um if I say big fingers that sounds really bad but I had one lovely old gentleman that was so so determined and he said look at my hands Mandy I can't possibly put contact lenses in with these but you know what we did it and he True. was delighted so you know don't look for excuses if you really want to have a go and you really want to do it and you're suitable you'll 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 enjoy them excellent thank you um i suppose the, the other area i'd like to get your um insight is the whole area of eye health eyes as you know are such a, a delicate organ um so are there tips and advice you would give listeners on ways to protect people's eyes oh absolutely there are loads of ways you can you can protect your eyes um but firstly, and really importantly, I would recommend regular eye examinations with your optometrist. Even if you think your eyes are fine, even if you think you can see OK, because in addition to measuring your vision, your optometrist, as we said before, will check the health of your eyes. And there are sadly some eye conditions that are asymptomatic in their early stages. And this means that you and this means that um, you won't know there's anything wrong. An yes. example of this is glaucoma. By the time you notice a problem with your vision, the damage has already started and sadly can't be reversed. But a simple pressure test by your optometrist can monitor for any early changes and then they can be addressed and hopefully reduce the impact on vision. Um, so that, that's my plug for your regular eye tests or right. eye examinations. Yes. Um, and that, you know, that is probably the single most important thing that you can do is just have have them regularly check that their, their, their health is still good. But, you know, think about diet and exercise. We are all aware that regular exercise and, and a balanced diet are important for general well-being and protecting against many health conditions. Um, and keeping a healthy balanced diet is something you can do to look after your eyes too. Now, make sure you include 
plenty of antioxidants, including vitamins and minerals um, in your diets. Now, these are found in the, the brightly coloured fruit and vegetables, such as oranges, red and yellow peppers, tomatoes, green leafy vegetables, um, seeds, nuts, dairy. Antioxidants are in lots of things, but a good, healthy, balanced diet will help promote general health. Now, you're probably aware or you've probably heard of lutein and zeaxanthin. Um, because these have been shown to offer some protection to the macula, and that's the part of our eyes which we use to process fine details such as faces. So look out for these food, uh, look out for foods that are rich in these. Essential fatty acids such as omega-3 um, is important for healthy eyes. Now we can't make omega-3 in our bodies, so we have to consume it in our diets. And a great source of this is oily fish, such as salmon or mackerel. So try and include a couple of portions of oily fish in your diet each week. And of course, don't forget to keep hydrated. This will help reduce the symptoms of um, dry eye. A couple of other points is that, you know, eating healthy will also maintain a healthy weight, which will keep our blood pressure under control and high blood pressure as we know, increases our risk of stroke, which happens when a blood vessel in our brain bleeds or becomes blocked. Now, if this, this bleed or this blockage is in the part of the brain that we used to see with, it can cause blind spots in our vision. And high blood pressure, unfortunately, also increases the likelihood of a blood vessel in our eye bleeding or becoming blocked directly, and this can sadly affect our vision, it may even re um, uh, result in, in total sight loss in one eye. So, you know, keeping healthy, keeping our balanced diet. I know everybody talks about it, but it's really important for eye health as well. Well, I think people um, hear about it so often that they actually don't fully understand the merit it has for every part of our body, including our eyes. So I, I think it's been yeah, really absolutely. important just to reinforce that message. Yeah, it, it's so important. You know, if you think that, you know, what, what's happening in the blood vessels in your body, that your eye is full of blood vessels too. So it's only natural. It's it's all going to be interlinked. And can I ask, you mentioned there the um, lutein. Uh, yeah. What food would you suggest is rich in, in that? That's usually the dark green leafy vegetables, um, the curly kale and the spinachy type um foods uh it's it's worth if it's it's really worth a google the list is so extensive but if you if you google lutein and zeaxanthin it will give you a really big list of all the all the foods that that that's present in but the the big one is that is the really dark the kale the dark vegetables okay great dark green. yeah good to know okay and is there any so other tips you would give anybody for um, improved eye health Oh, the, the biggie, another biggie is smoking. And the message here is stop smoking if you can, because we all know that it's got negative impact on our whole health. True. So most of us know it causes lung cancer, but it can cause blindness too. Do you know smokers are up to four times more likely than non-smokers to de develop age-related macular degeneration or AMD? Okay. And if you've already got a genetic predisposition to AMD, you are 20 times more likely to get the condition if you smoke. I think that's staggering. You that know, smoking's the yeah. biggest modifiable risk factor for AMD. And if we can stop smoking, it, it's going to reduce our chances of getting the condition and also reduce the chances of it progressing if we do get it. Um, and, you know, passive smoking too, that can still have the same effect. So make sure that you're, um, you know, you're not in smoky atmospheres. Keep out in the fresh air. That's a very, very um, staggering statistic there. I'm, I'm quite <laughs> floored by it, to be honest. Absolutely. It's um, it's a sign of a good mother. We, we often laugh is that when my my youngest daughter went off to university, um, she had uh, she met people that smoked. And she would go up to them and say to them, do you know smoking makes you blind? <laughs> so she's That's obviously been scary. listening to me. <laughs> and, you know, cigarette smoke is is horrible. It's It contains so many toxic chemicals. It damages those delicate retinal cells and it fast forwards aging. I mean, it fast forwards aging in the whole body um, and it reduces antioxidant levels. It increases oxidant levels and it reduces our 
our body's ability to protect itself. It's, you know, it's such an neat it's not an easy thing to stop. Um, I didn't mean to say it like that, but it is a modifiable risk factor that we are all capable of doing. And I have that conversation with all my patients as part of my general chat at the beginning of the consultation. I ask them if they smoke and I encourage them to seek ways a bit about how they may may stop um, because it just has such an impact on vision. And do you think in your experience um, that the number of patients uh, answering yes I do smoke has gone down over the years? Definitely. Good. Definitely, definitely less people smoking now but you know there are still a few out there and there are still a few out there that are blissfully unaware of the damage it can potentially do to their eyes. That's true yeah I, I would agree I, I didn't make that correlation before about smoking potentially leading to blindness. Yeah that can do. I had a, um, a, a youngish chap that had had glaucoma from he had an unusual form of childhood glaucoma he'd he'd sadly lost an eye through it and we were just generally having a conversation um and I obviously I don't know why I hadn't had the smoking conversation before but I I just said to him and of course you don't smoke do you because that's something else you can do to look after your sight and he said well I do and I said, I can't believe that you're you're still smoking after all the conversations we've had. You know, we need to protect the one eye you've got. And fair fair play to him. He did he did go away and stop. Oh, fair play to him. Good, good, good. Well, it, it, it certainly is a, a scaring statistic. <laughs> um, and as you say, it is in people's gifts to give up smoking, uh, despite the addiction that it is and the challenge that it can be for some people. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we need to be mindful of that. We need to recognise that it is a big ask for some people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, get help, get support. It, you're going to be much better in the long run. True, true. Um, are there ones that you would suggest? Yeah, there's a couple a couple of other things we can do. Um, think about UV protection and, you know, if you spend a lot of time outdoors in the sunshine or on a sunbed even, you must protect your eyes from the harmful ultraviolet light. Even in the winter months, it's still there. Um, and we're a good quality pair of sunglasses. Exposure to ultraviolet light has been linked to certain eye conditions, including cataract, and there may even be a link to um, AMD, macular degeneration. Don't forget children's eyes too. So, you know, make sure their eyes are protected, but be careful to look out for a, a CE mark or a British standard mark, which is the manufacturer's assurance that the glasses have been made to the appropriate safety standards. Because if they're not of the appropriate standard, they might actually be doing more harm than good. That's you can fair. also protect, sorry, you can also protect your eyes by wearing a hat or a, a you know, a, a visor, if it's got a brim on it, in, in bright sunlight and sometimes you know children don't want to wear sunglasses pop a hat on with a brim because that will protect some of the light rays coming down and the the only other thing there is if you're you're out in um, winter sports you, it's doubly important to protect because the the sunlight will reflect off of the snow or if you're out on the water it will reflect off the water and and still have that damage in effect. Yeah, I think people probably underestimate, particularly in winter, how the, the brightness of the sun can cause such a glare. Yeah, and the UV is still out there. You know, it's even on a cloudy day, you know, there is UV that, and we should be protecting our eyes. You can actually get UV um, filters, inhibitors put on spectacle lenses. So if you're really concerned about it, talk to your optometrist. OK. OK, so um, my last biggie is DIY, OK? And I think we're all a little bit guilty of this. But when we're doing DIY, um, according to the Eye Health UK, DIY activity, whether it be in the garden or in the home, is causing more than 20,000 eye injuries a year. It's another wow. staggering statistic, isn't it? Yeah. Um, some can even lead to serious or permanent eye damage. So please, please protect your eyes whenever you're doing DIY. So wear protective eyewear where there's a risk of objects or liquids entering your eye, hammering, drilling, welding, painting even, um, or laying insulation. And ordinary glasses and sunglasses don't 
always offer a good enough protection. So invest in some good quality goggles or safety glasses that conform to the European standard. You can you can get safety specs in DIY stores and your optometrist can actually advise you on prescription safety goggles if you need to wear a prescription as well. Mm -hmm. um, it you know that's another really easy thing you can do to protect your eyes and then you know the number of bits of dust and things that chip off and, and somehow end up in your eye is, is staggering so just be a little bit proactive about looking after them and and the other obvious thing is you know don't touch your face or your eyes till you've washed your hands afterwards because you could be transferring dust or chemicals or even sap from plants if you've been out in the garden so just really be mindful of your eyes and i i suppose it, it seems like that but we actually are not mindful of enough uh, which does lead to accidents um and, and i suppose in, in your line of work what are the most kind of common injuries that you've come across well that that's probably it actually it's bits going in yeah. the eye foreign bodies so dust from diy or grasses or seeds even animal hairs um and they they're there's just that it's really irritation and people come in and say I've got something in my eye it's really really uncomfortable and um, what happens is they tend to get lodged underneath the top eyelid so that if you can imagine every time you blink it's scratching across the surface of the eye yeah. now fortunately these are usually really easy to remove using the magnica magnification from my um my slit lamp that's the big microscope that you pop your chin on and I, I, I shine a light with um and instantly you know you pull the hair out or you pull the little seed out um the, the patient goes oh that's so much better so it's it's easy to rectify but of course if you've been wearing safety specs it's not going to have got in in the first place yeah. um other other injuries are probably again very inconsequential at the time but very very painful so maybe a, a scratch from a, a child's fingernail or even a pet um that just inadvertently scratches the surface of the eye or again a sharp little bit of dust that has flown in and flown out again and just left a little little scratch on the surface of the eye um these usually just need um lubricating eye drops sometimes they might need um some prophylactic antibiotics but 99 times out of 100 just keeping the ocular surface lubricated it heals up again very very quickly um more sinister injuries, I think, tend to present straight to local A&E. I would say the most common ones that, that come into my clinic are these little foreign body type ones. But one thing I do see a lot of um, that I'm sure your listeners will, will resonate with is, is a bloodshot eye. And sometimes they can look really, really dramatic and the patient is completely unaware of it being there. So they might suddenly look in the mirror and think, oh my goodness, my eye's red. Or a friend will say, what have you done to your eye? And then you go and look in the mirror and there's all this red in your eye. And it's, it is actually much more, or it does look much more dramatic than it actually is. And sometimes it literally just happens. And sometimes it can be caused by a cough or a sneeze. And it's when one of the tiny, tiny little blood vessels in the conjunctiva bleeds into the space between the outer layers of the eye. Um, it's a bit like getting a bruise under your skin. 99 times out of 100, it's painless and it will take about a week to clear a bit like a bruise. Sometimes the eye feels a little bit scratchy um, and a lubricating eye drop is usually all that is, is sufficient um, or is needed to, to make the eye more comfortable. I think the only um, thing to think about with this is that if it would happen on a regular basis, then um, we would probably advise you to go and get your blood pressure checked just in case it was being caused by an increase of blood pressure. But as I say, most of the time, it's just one of those things that that just happens. Um, but that's that's probably about um, off the top of my head, the, the most injuries I would see or occasions I would see where people would come in concerned about something that they feel has happened to their eye. To be fair, Mandy, it, it sounds as if um, so individuals might come to you um, with, as you rightly say, some fo foreign objects in their in their eyes or um, kind of a, a, a scratch or something. And, and if something is even more sinister, they might have gone to A&E. But yeah. um, Nonetheless, I think it's been really, really informative and helpful for our listeners to, to get an overview of the 
professions who are involved in eye care um, and eye health in general. And um, I've really learned a lot myself around uh, ways to Im improve my own eye health, um, practical, tangible ways, which will certainly benefit um, our listeners eye health. Um, so I really want to say I'm grateful for your time and energy and um, expertise in informing us today of the, the value of ensuring that we all maintain a good eye health and to consistently uh, attend regular checkups with our optometrist, not only just for to check at vision, but also eye health in general. Oh, you're very welcome. It's been an absolute pleasure. You know, there's there's so many tips and tricks that you can do to look after your eyes. But like you say, the, the biggest advice I can give anybody is if you've got any concerns at all, go and talk to your optometrist. Correct, correct. Well, listen, Mandy, thank you again. Um, and just to remind listeners um, that anybody interested in accessing NCBI services uh, can contact our info line, which is 1850 33 43 53. Many thanks again, Mandy.